Hi, this is Reg Atwal and welcome to another episode of Book Videos. This is the book for today, Empires of the Mind, Lessons to Lead and Succeed in a Knowledge-Based World by the legendary Dennis Waitley, uh, who's a best-selling author. He, he has been around a, a many, many years, made a huge impact to people like me from 20 years ago, getting involved in some of his coaching and mentoring programs. He's also a bestseller of the New Dynamics of Winning, and one of his first ever programs was The Psychology of Winning. So this, is, this was published back in uh, 1995, 266 pages full of great content. I'm going to take a few things that I feel could be relevant for today, uh, and thanks for tuning in. And what I love is really, first of all, the title, Lessons to Lead in and Succeed in a Knowledge-Based World. I mean, think of what's going on in 2020 when it comes to digitization, a knowledge-based world, data, information. And I was doing my own research thinking some of the things he's mentioned in this book from 1995, I was looking back thinking, wow, Facebook uh, started in February 2004, 1995. Google, Google September, September 1998, two years after years years it was published. published. Amazon 1994 is the only one I could find that started a year before this book was published. And I'm talking about the unicorns, the giants, the companies, brands that have transformed the last 10, 20 years. Netflix, born on August the 29th, 1999. Tesla, July the 1st, 2003. Uber, March 2009 is a baby out of that list. Uh, and to think, you know, what have they achieved in such a short space of time? And uh, it got me thinking about when I got my first mobile phone. It got me thinking about, uh, I made a note here of my Nokia 9210. Uh, if any of you had one of those, mention it in the comments. I'd love to know whether you had a Nokia 9210, which was probably one of the first ever smartphones that came out uh, after the traditional Nokia phones that you would use for basic texting and SMSs and making your phone calls. And, and, and looking back, that 9210 came out in June 2001. Again, six years or so after this book came out. So when he talks about knowledge, economy, data, information, he's a visionary. And some of the things he's got on the back cover really got me. He said, yesterday, natural resources defined power. Today, knowledge is power. Yesterday, hierarchy was the model. Today, synergy is the mandate. Yesterday, leaders commanded and controlled. Today, leaders empower and coach. Yesterday, shareholders came first. Today, customers come first. Yesterday, employees took orders. Today, teams make decisions. Yesterday, seniority signified status. Today, creativity drives status. And then the list goes on. And it's packed full of really good points about really what was happening in the past and now what's happening in the present. But you, grow, you have to remember his present okay, was in 1995. So I'm going to get stuck into a few uh, really cool areas in the book that I really like, having a chance to reread it again for this video series. And he's got, a, he's got a real powerful quote. Dennis says, you must learn from your mistakes, but not lean on your past successes. That's a very deep comment. You must learn from your past mistakes but not lean on your past successes. He says, no society has ever survived its own success. No geographical empire or civilization has reached the top and stayed there permanently. All leading societies, industries, and countries of the past rested on their laurels, were knocked off their pedestals. When I gave a seminar for savings and loan executives several years ago at the depth of the SNL crisis, I was joined by John Madden, former head coach of the Oakland, now the LA Raiders, turned sports commentator. Colorful John summed up the essentials of winning and losing. You're only as good as next season. 
You never get your hand stamped to get back in the dance. When you win the Super Bowl or the gold medal, you think to yourself that you've arrived. And the tendency is to enjoy the view from the top. But when you're on top, you become a target and are benchmarked by all your competitors who want what you have. That's why it's difficult to repeat, and he says to Pete, or what we call three Pete, as a world champion in anything. I really love that. You know, don't get too big headed if you're doing really well. Don't lean on your past successes. They're over. They're done. You're only as good as next week. You're only as good as next month. You're only as good as maybe what happened last week. So it has to, we have to keep growing, but you also have to learn from your mistakes. So he's got a whole section in the book where he talks about that. Moving on from there, I also like this quote. It says, you must continue to gain expertise, but avoid thinking like an expert. The acquisition of knowledge is a lifelong experience, not a collection of facts or skills. Not long ago, what you learned in school was largely all you needed to learn. You could rely on that knowledge for the rest of your life. With knowledge expanding exponentially, there is no, this is no longer true. Hundreds of scientific papers are published daily. Every 30 seconds, some new technological company produces yet another innovation. Your formal education has a very short shelf life. So in this world, Dennis says, with ever more to know, leaders need and many are demonstrating a new attitude towards learning. Although most are too busy managing to spend much time in classrooms, they continue learning by teaching themselves, absorbing new ideas and knowledge largely on the run. And pausing here, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put together this book video series on the channel is for people who are on the run. They're too busy. When was the last time they picked up a book and, and read a book after uh, graduating from university? Uh, I love books. I love reading. I love rereading books. I love uh, folding corners of pages. I even like smelling books. Anyone like that? Okay, sounds strange, but I love the smell of books. Uh, touching them, feeling them, reading them, making notes, highlighting things. And it's amazing how many people don't do that, but hopefully book videos like this can give you small insights that can help you immediately. Uh, their love of learning, he says, springs from a natural curiosity and their risk-taking nature affects the way they learn. It leads them to dig deeper, to want to know not just how, but also why. Interestingly enough, the people who do know why often have many people with know-how working for them. So again, in summary, the quote there, you must continue to gain expertise but avoid thinking like an expert. Are you constantly growing? I, have you just called yourself an expert based on the past or in the present, are you still learning? What new information, what new knowledge are you inputting into your operating system? There's a, there's a great section, I don't, I don't have time to go through all of this today, but there's a great section on page 27. If you get a chance to buy this book from Amazon, from a bookshop, from Dennis's website, I make sure that the details are in the description area. Uh, there's a whole test he's got around testing your assumptions. I'll, I'll take two out of the list here. I'd rather know the truth than be right. Is that you? I'm often accused of asking too many questions. I don't believe in seeking counseling unless I've got a serious problem. So he's got this whole test in here which is really, really powerful. He talks about the price of success. You know, are you really ready to be successful? Because there is a price to pay. Taking responsibility, for example, giving up bad habits, taking responsibility for setting up an example in our own lives. And he, he focuses on this in all aspects of life. He also talks about page 32 here, who's in charge? Are you really in charge of who you are as a person? Uh, for example, you can control what you do with most of your free time during the day and the evening. Are you in control of your time? 
during the day and evening? Or are, do you have other influences in your environment and other people who are controlling your time? Do you control your own attitude or are other people controlling your attitude? You can control your commitments, the things you absolutely promise, promise yourself and others that you'll do. Are you someone who keeps your promises and you're in control of that? Or you get distracted and you don't keep your promises. So there's a whole section here about who's in charge and becoming a great leader. Uh, moving on from here, there's a section here where he talks about self-esteem. And he really rattles everything. He's, he's really looking at the contradictions mirror, mirror on the wall. He talks about... Value is inside out, but essentially when it comes to self-esteem, self-confidence, he's got four legs, as he call, calls it, on a chair, which need to be looked at if you really want to boost your internal, inside, and then outside self. And those are broken down as follows really briefly. One is a sense of belonging. If you feel that you've got a sense of belonging, uh, he says that the psychologists call a, a affiliation drive encompasses people, places, and possessions, an instinct for belonging, for being wanted, accepted, enjoyed, and loved by close ones is extremely powerful. So ask yourself right now, for you personally, as well as the people in your team, in your family business, or if you're an entrepreneur, first generation, maybe you're from a corporate, is, is there a deep sense of belonging for you and the people around you? Second, a sense of individual identity. He talks about that no human being is exactly like another, not even identical twin. We are all unique combinations of talents and traits that never existed before and will never exist again in quite the same package. Leaders stand out particularly for knowing who they are, have confidence in what you believe or they believe, and feeling respect for their present lives as well as for their potential. So number two is about a sense of individual identity. I'll briefly go through the headings, but not into depth. A sense of worthiness is number three. And then finally, he talks about number four, the sense of control and competence. And self-efficacy is what he talks about here. Later on in the same section, he refers to a gentleman called Sam Deep, who was the author of Smart Moves back in 1990 that has a 10-step uh, questionnaire in the book to work on self-esteem. So I'm going to pick a few out. He says, one, document their accomplishments so they can't pretend they don't exist. Never allow team members to lose sight of their accomplishments and with it, their potential for success. So what he's really talking about here is take the people around you who work for you and list out and document every single one of their accomplishments. If you do this, he says, people can't pretend that they don't exist and it can really boost self-esteem. Teach them how to get what they want from other people. Teach your people to be assertive rather than too aggressive or too passive. I like that. Uh, and I'll take one more, keep them in ongoing training programs. This gives them a, a vote of confidence and careful chosen training with further contribute to their effectiveness and ultimately their self-esteem. Just on that note, how much training are you giving your workforce right now, especially with the crisis this year uh, and people working from home, maybe in lockdown? I've got clients I'm working with right now where on a weekly basis, we're doing online live events. Zoom meetings, webinars are happening for the entire workforce. Constant learning is taking place because remember, it's not about be being an expert based on the past. It's about the present and how you're building new knowledge and information to be ahead of your competition and win. So those are a few things that I really liked. Uh, then here's another quote. You must look within for value, but must look beyond for perspective. And he's got a list here of how do you find your passion? How do you work on a business model that can grow and combining your passion with a good business model? So here's a few questions. What product or service can you offer that isn't now being offered? Okay, that isn't being offered today. How can you position yourself in a way that's different from how you're doing it right now? Uh, how can you do this less expensively? And that could be to do with a process or a procedure that could be become more convenient maybe for the customer. 
How can you make a living, I like this one, how can you make a living from doing what you consider fun, challenging, and never boring for you? So those are a few things to take in consideration there. Uh, I like this section. Towards the end of the book, he talks about procrastination, the procrastination inquiry. Do you put off tough jobs or avoid difficult assignments in a hope that something will change and you can escape the responsibility? So this section by Dennis is all about taking responsibility. Uh, leaders, people who are at, 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 at running at peak performance have this ability not to procrastinate. Uh, they don't wait for things to be perfect to take action. And he's testing you in this book when it comes to that. So if you buy the book, to page 213, you've got to look at for this section. Do you put off important tasks by reorganizing your desk and cleaning your files on a regular basis? One or another form of sharpening your pencils, but you're not really taking action. Are you afraid of change, risk, or new situations, and therefore you're not taking action? When faced with a difficult or unpleasant situation, do you tend to get sick or even have accidents on a regular basis? This could be as a result of being a procrastinator. And then he's got another 10 or so in this section. So he says here, two major fears at sire procrastination are fear of the unknown and fear of inferiority or looking for or looking foolish. Okay, so really stepping into the unknown and really looking foolish. He goes, a third fear of success is often overlooked. Many people, even many executives, fear success because it carries added responsibility that can seem too heavy to bear, such as setting an example of excellence that calls for additional effort and willingness to take risks. Playing it safe can seem more tempting than a need to step forward with determination to do it now and do it right. So again, it's all about overcoming procrastination. Are you taking responsibility? What are you waiting for? Get on with it. Do it. Okay, this is a perfect opportunity in 2020 to build potentially the next unicorn, as many of the companies I mentioned at the beginning of this episode only came about in the last 15 years or so and have become multi-billion dollar organizations. They took a risk. They were bold. They were courageous. They did something brand new that others were not prepared to do. There's a whole section here on love and marriage because you think, you know, to become a good leader, why is that important? And Dennis talks about where love and marriage is really important, your partner, your life partner, you know, what's your relationship with them? He says, we can too easily become preoccupied with professional goals, financial matters, and family responsibilities. I sense our longing to play hide and seek, to dine and dance in candlelight, to walk on the beach uh, as we did in our courtship. Susan and I, he's referring to, have promised each other to keep moving our marriage from position to relationship power. We do more walking and less talking about schedules. We're more spontaneous and less structured. We touch each other and listen to music more, take more evening swims and light more fires in the fireplace. With all the children having flown the nest, we travel together on my business trips. We want to experience, experience each other without interruption. So we set aside more time without phones, manuscripts, faxes, back in 1995, children or even friends. On our special days, Susan sometimes keeps intruders at bay by setting roadblocks with flashing lights in front of our driveway. I love that. So I really admire Dennis's values here, and he's saying to become a good leader, you, a good leader, uh, not leader. You've got to work on your home life. You've got to have a successful relationship with the people around you. And in this case, he's talking about your significant other, your life partner. Because if you make that work, that will be expressed automatically into being a great leader and showing up in the business world. So finally, I want to get towards the end and leave you with this last piece. And before I finish this off, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, leave your comments. By doing that, it helps us with the algorithm on YouTube and other platforms where we can reach more people. And my mission is very simple, to inspire as many families as I can in this lifetime and ultimately businesses 
and I prefer to combine the two because my mission and, and the last 18 years has been focused on helping family businesses. And there's a lot of other episodes on our channel related to family businesses that you could watch. But for now, let me complete this episode with this beautiful uh, extraction from something called I'd Pick More Daisies by a gentleman called Brother Jeremiah. And it's a few verses from him. And it's all about if I could live my life again, what would you do? If I could live my life again, I'd laugh at my misfortunes more and at other people's predicaments less. Spend more time counting my blessings, less time scrutinizing my blemishes. I'd spend more time playing with my children and grandchildren, less time watching professional athletes perform. More time enjoying what I have, less time thinking about the things I don't have. If I could live my life again, I'd walk in the rain more without an umbrella and listen less to weather reports. I'd spend more time outdoors in small towns and much less time in tall buildings and big cities. I'd eat more of everything healthy and delicious, less of everything each meal, saving enough on the bill to feed a starving child. I'd be more listening and less, I'd do more listening and less talking so I could learn to understand rather than be desperate to be heard. I'd spend more time looking at trees and climbing them, less time flipping through magazines from dead trees. If I could live my life again, I'd get more beach sand between my toes and less friction between myself and others. I'd take more long baths and fewer showers. I can't explain why I've always been in such a hurry to spend my time. I'd spend more time with old people and animals, less time with strangers at clubs and parties. I'd act the age of my children and grandchildren more and act my own age less. I'd visit libraries, bookstores and computer networks more than malls and movie theatres less. I'd play the piano more and play fewer mindless games like solitaire. I'd give my spouse and children more tender touches and much less advice. If I could live my life again, I'd spend more time involved in the present moment, less time remembering and anticipating. I'd be more aware of my core values and my life mission, and less concerned with the reasons why I might not measure up. I'd smile more, frown less. I'd express my feelings more, try less to impress my friends and neighbours. I'd forgive and ask for forgiveness more, and curse my adversaries less. Most of all, I'd be more spent spontaneous and active, less hesitant and subdued. When a great idea or spur of the moment adventure popped up, an Easter egg hunt, an open house at school, a game of hide and seek, an opportunity to solve a problem at work or to satisfy a disgruntled customer, a hayride, a chance to build a snowman or paint over graffiti, an invitation to watch a lunar eclipse or a shuttle launch. I'd be less likely to stay in my chair objecting. It's not in our plan. And more inclined to jump up and say, yes, let's do this. In conclusion, Dennis says, although I can't live my life again, I'm still going to live the new way every day. I'll never have all the moments I've missed, but I do have all the time remaining. You must climb the next mountain, but never reach the summit. So that's the end of this uh, episode, Empires of the Mind by Dennis Waitley. Please check out the book. Try grab it on Amazon or your local bookshop. I hope you enjoyed the book video episode and come back again and bye for now. Thanks for watching.